Okay, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahim. Good evening. I would like to um, start this uh, session. Um, myself, Dr. Muhammad Abdul Azim, I'm consultant ophthalmologist with a special interest uh, with uh, of uveitis. Um, and uh, my uh, co-host, uh, Dr. Sharif Shawi, is a consultant um, rheumatologist and immunological disorder consultant. We're going to discuss um, the uh, relation between uveitis and uh, the uh, immunology uh, consultant and how the, the cooperation between the two of us, of us will benefit the patient and uh, how to reach the diagnose and manage the, the, the disease. Um, Dr. Sharif, I would like first uh, to give the um, audience a, a, a generalized view of uh, what we're doing. Basically, um, when a patient comes to me, uh, I take a good history of um, his eye condition, of course, but I also do uh, a, a detailed systemic inquiry of whether he has any systemic disorders and the, um, and the history of this uh, disorder and whether if he had any treatment before in any other place and the, uh, the impact of this treatment on his uh, condition. Uh, once I do that, I write all my data in, uh, in a letter and ask Dr. Sharif uh, mm -hmm. to have a look and do a systemic uh, inquiry and ex a systemic examination with, uh, with a special um, uh, concentration on, uh, uh, on my differential diagnosis, my initial differential diagnosis, uh, which would have revealed by the ophthalmic examination. Um, this, this helps uh, Dr. Sharif to narrow down his investigations, not, not to do plenty of investigations. And as well as um, sometimes he, he finds uh, disease that I, I didn't think that he had, the patient had. So um, this kind of cooperation between me and Dr. Sharif is very helpful in, in uh, the way that uh, I can call him anytime, he can call me anytime uh, um, to, uh, to consult about the patient uh, in question and to, uh, to, to have more details. And this would all benefit uh, the management of the patient. Um, Dr. Sharif, uh, other than my handwriting that is, is, is poor, what, what is the problems that you, you tend to have with my, my requests? It's a pleasure to share with you and all the doctors here. I get a referral, a case of uveitis from an eye doctor. Either it comes with, uh, you know, just a case of uveitis or with a, a description of the intraocular signs and a narrow differential diagnosis. So it's, it is better for me to get, to get it this way, with narrow differential diagnosis with some of the... Uh, description of what is going on inside the to narrow the differential diagnosis. Then I go through a detailed history taking and a thorough clinical examination. And I do a routine a basic blood test, like complete blood picture, kidney function test, liver function test, acute phase reactants, urine analysis. And according to the clinical scenario, I request some specific tests, immunological tests or imaging mortality to reach a definite diagnosis or a presumed diagnosis. And we, so, okay, slowly I contact with uh, you, we put a management plan and uh, the drugs will go on and, and we follow the patient. Maybe after some time, we, we, we can see another, a new symptoms or a clinical sign that enable us to reach a definite diagnosis. For example, a skin lesion or a lymph node to take a biopsy to make a definite diagnosis. Or we can go to you, we can reach to a presumed diagnosis and treat according. Dr. Mohammed. Um, the baseline investigation. Sorry. The, the baseline investigations that you uh, request, you said that you do a reactive uh, analysis. What's a reactive analysis? Acute phase reactants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Acute phase reactants, like ESR and CRB. Yeah, okay. So th this would give you a broad uh, idea whether there's an inflammation going on somewhere or not. 
this is yes, but this basic inv investigation is very important to, to in two ways. Uh, as a basic investigation to follow the patient if there is a change in the lab parameters later on, or uh, you know to follow up uh, follow up good follow up for the drugs itself for the possible side effects. Right. So, um, do you also do uh, blood pressure and measure the weight of the patient and, and the we do thorough the clinical examination? Thorough clinical. Right. Right. Okay. So. Um, once, once you've uh, had a differential diagnosis, narrow differential diagnosis, and that uh, you want to clarify something from, from the eye point of view, you often call me and ask whether is it, is it possible that this patient's condition, the eye condition, could be explained by this or that. And that would give you uh, a thread that you can go after uh, with further investigation, or you can rule out uh, certain entities. Uh, is, is, do you remember? Uh... Yes, it is very important for me, uh, you know, your intraocular findings, the intraocular findings, because if you go, you, know, you, you can narrow the differential, if it's a TB, or you want to exclude TB, it's uh, So it's, it, you made it easy for me to uh, narrow the differential and reach a definite diagnosis. Well, I'm, I'm trying to, um, to show our audience that our cooperation our uh, phone calls and uh, letters uh, and close uh, interaction, this would all help uh, the patient. And uh, the lack of communication between uh, the, the ophthalmologist and the immunologist uh, definitely uh, is a burden and is a, um, a, a good or a, a big reason for uh, failure of treatment or failure of management. And I, I often fall in this problem with patients coming from, uh, you know, from the periphery of the country, where um, we can't visit Dr. Sharif easily, so you have to uh, visit another immunologist, local immunologist, who often is very good immunologist, by the way, but there is no communications or very poor communication, and this um, often causes cause plenty of problems uh, in uh, in changing the treatment or uh, on deciding of the uh, what's the entity of the disease and whether to go on with the treatment or to taper it. Very, very often, uh, the, this uh, failure of communication uh, causes a disruption of the management of the patient. Uh, so I, I'm trying to uh, elicit how, how important, highlight how important this communication is. Um, my, my next question, um, the, uh, the, the patients often um, um, do not understand very well why do they have to go on uh, all this treatment and why do they have to visit uh, a, a, a physician when the problem is there in their eye? So I, I often, uh, you know, it takes me a good quarter of an hour to explain why is it important. So in, in your words, why, why is it important to, uh, to keep this follow-up uh, uh, active even after you you decided the the treatment and you decided the disease entity. Why is the maintenance uh, visits uh, the follow up visits with the physician is important? As you know, the uh, the, the uveitis is always chronic uveitis, and uh, there is you know uh, uh, we do a lot of effort uh, in the to, to you know to treat the acute infection to for and the patient then enter in a remission. And to maintain the remission, it takes a long time uh, for tabling the drugs, changing the drugs. And all of this, you know, take a lot of time and interaction between you and me. So if it is very important uh, for the patient, for better management and uh, better follow-up, to keep this interaction and regular visits, you know, uh, to avoid the, also the complication and side effects of the drugs. And uh, to maintain, you know, the patient in a good remission for a long time. Actually, um, I feel very uh, safe when I'm doing this. When 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 I'm sure that someone is looking uh, after me. Um, when, whenever I do something wrong, or if I over prescribe a drug or or stop a drug, there's uh, someone who's uh, checking after me and uh, reminding me that this is the wrong way to go. Or you have to correct your way in this, in this or that. 
the other the other um, important point is that uh, in uveitis you have always to keep an open mind. You don't you don't put a diagnosis and stick with this diagnosis. You can always we can always revise this diagnosis if any new signs have appeared. And this is the importance of having a physician with me. Um, very often, other signs that appear uh, elsewhere in the body that uh, can change the diagnosis altogether. And, uh, and it's very important not to keep treating the eye, whereas there is another problem in the in the body. Uh, most notable, of course, something like lymphoma or something life-threatening that the uh, the uh, Dr. Sharif can uh, can readily detect if the uh, the the, uh, the important sign appears up uh, on, um, during the follow-up period. Reach a proper management of proper diagnosis. Uh, this first patient um, is a patient from Sudan who came with uh, large areas of, of, uh, with acute drop of vision, with large areas of uh, choroiditis, uh, appearing um, like serpiginous choroiditis, extent that is much more extensive. And uh, the first differential diagnosis um, I made was TB. So I asked Dr. Uh, I did a, a cover letter that this patient is from Sudan and had his symptoms from uh, so so much time and that he's systemically he's not complaining of anything. And I did a systemic inquiry asking specifically about any chest trouble or any other trouble in the body. And he uh, denied any problem uh, except for his uh, eye condition. However, um, I know that there is this entity, a latent TB, in which there is no other uh, manifestations of TB in the body. And I've written a uh, discover letter to uh, Dr. Sharif saying that I am suspecting that this patient has a TB, uh, latent TB, and I would like you to do a systemic examination and do a uh, skin test or quantiform gold test, whatever you think is appropriate. Dr. Sharif, um, when you uh, saw this patient, you did, you did what? You, you examined him. How did you examine him? Yes. Uh, first of all, you know when I ref when you refer such a patient to me, you, you you said that you are suspecting TB, a latent TB. So I have to exclude first other differential. So uh, any other possible causes, I think. So I go through a detailed history taking and a clinical examination as well. And we do some tests, the basic test, as I said before. Here, if I exclude any other causes, in every, uh, if everything comes normal, and this is the case, most of the cases with latent TB, you can't find anything abnormal. So you order uh, either a tuber clean skin test or the gold test, a gamma quantifron test, and chest X-ray or CT scan. So if the, uh, the tuberculin skin test, all the tuberculin skin test or the gold test uh, have some advantage over the other. The gold test, I will start by the gold test. It measures the in vitro uh, release of gamma interferon uh, of T cells uh, from two very specific antigen uh, related to Mycobacterium tuberculosis, but not related to the BCG vaccine. That's why, if this come positive, it is due to TB, not uh, BCG vaccination. And this is the advantage of this test. The disadvantage it is expensive test, and most of the patient, oh no, mo not most of the patient. Some patient find it expensive to do it. The alternative is the skin tuber clean test. It's a cheap test, but it is affected by factors, uh, many factors. Uh, first, the uh, size of the induration and the age and the immune status of the patient, the uh, region, whether endemic or not. Uh, so uh, according to these factors, you have to read the test, for example. If it comes uh, in duration less than five milli, we consider it negative. But if it is between five and 10 milli in duration, we consider it positive in the immunocompromised. 
uh, if, if anyone is even compromised or has a positive history of uh, exposure to, you know, to active TB patient. Uh, if it is more than 10, we consider there is 10 millimeter in duration, we consider it positive in endemic uh, Iraq and Egypt, or, uh, you know, in health uh, care providers, like our doctors and nurses. If it is more than 14 millimeter, it is unlikely to be BCG vaccination. It is latent TB or infection. So, we just we can order it, but there is many factors, you know, determine the uh, reading of the test. But finally, we can, you know, if it's come to positive, with, for me, if it's come positive, more than 14 millimeter in duration, I consider it positive. Uh, so we so it either depends on the clean test or the gold quantification. And then the chest X-ray and CT. If there is uh, calcified granuloma, so it will add in the diagnosis. If this comes negative, so it depends on the uh, test. So we diagnose it as latent TB. Uh, and I think we have to start the anti-tuberculous treatment. And after many times, if there is a response, uh, mentioned by you in the response to anti-tuberculous treatment. So that's the confirmation. This case is TB, ocular TB. Uh, of course, we have a problem here. When you prescribe anti-tuberculous treatment, it is, you can't uh, get it from the pharmacy, but you have to go to a chest hospital to get the anti-tuberculous. Start the treatment. I think we have a good connection now with doctors that facilitate us to, for the patient to get the treatment without delay. And I think what's right. So, what I got from, from you now that uh, we've got the quantiferone gold test, which is basically an in vitro uh, exposure of antigens that is not the, uh, the ones used in vaccination uh, in a test tube and exposure to the T cells of the patient and see whether the T cells of the patient will produce gamma interferon that can uh, uh, active against this um, antigens, it will produce the interferon and the test will be positive. And the yeah. great advantage of this uh, test is that it's not affected by the um, immunization of the patient, previous immunization of the patient. And then there's a new test there, the uh, quantiferon gold test plus that has added a third antigen. Um, to cover even the more rare uh, TB strains. Yes. The other uh, thing that I understood from you that I would mean uh, patients um, are often come to us already on steroids. So would you consider that an immunocompromised patient? Yes. Uh, and then you need a larger in duration area to, to be sure, or, or sorry, if, if it's a small, you can still be a TB. Smaller area, smaller. Uh, if it's small, you can still consider that TB and you would Cross confirm that with quantiferon gold test, which will not yeah. be affected by the immune uh, uh, status of the patients. Point is, um, I, I would like to uh, point out to the audience that we often start the um, the uh, anti tuberculous treatment, and this would actually worsen the eye condition because uh, uh, of the um, presumed death of the uh, uh, bacillus and release of the antigen into the bloodstream. This would make the uveitis even worse. So we often start steroids right away with the anti anti tuberculous treatment, and that would um, improve the uveitis anyway. So the, here, the therapeutic test of TB of anti TB uh, antibiotics is, is not really very valid because you would be confused whether the patient is better because of the steroids or whether because of the anti tuberculous treatment. Because this is the this is actually the uh, recommended. Uh, Guidelines. Yeah, can the give us guidelines is to start steroid yeah. and anti-tuberculous treatment right, right away. Um, our next slide is another patient with the uh, peripheral vascu uh, obli obliterative uh, vasculitis and um, bilaterally, and the, actually this patient presented with vitreous hemorrhage in my life as as the first symptom. This is the other good eye with, uh, as you can see, retinal hemorrhages and peripheral ischemia. Um, in the past, we used to um, 
uh, just put a label on this as Eels disease. And we, we often uh, had a doubt whether Eels disease is related to um, TB or not. But uh, at the present time, this is largely considered to be most probably TB. And this would be confirmed by the, again, skin test or quantiform gold test, um, uh, depending. In this particular patient, um, I, I sent Dr. Sharif this patient, and he um, started him on anti-tuberculous treatment, the triple therapy, and on steroids. However, after six months of, uh, of treatment, the patient um, had reactivation and uh, again worsening of his condition despite uh, all the treatment and despite him being on steroids. So I interpret this as um, an ongoing TB uh, infection and that requires uh, a further course. When, when you decide for a, a further course, do you often go for a, another six months or is it just the three months and, uh, and what do you do? Actually, first, when we decide to start the anti tuberculous drug, we give the here the four drugs. Uh, the isonizide, uh, infambicin, infambitol, and brizinamide for two months. And continue after that uh, on uh, isonizide and rifampicin for another 47 months. If you repeat it again, I think we repeat it for, for another four months or six months. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is the recommended uh, uh, therapy. Right. Uh, this this uh, same patient had this rash, a brownish discolored rash that he said that was reddish before it uh, healed and leave a brownish uh, uh, faint uh, opacity or uh, lesion. So it, it, what do you think this might be? When you're not sure about a lesion, you take a biopsy, don't you? Yeah, but I refer him to a skin doctor first. And, uh, you know, right. if uh, he can take a biopsy or not, his decision. Right. Because we just recently, I've sent you uh, a patient with vasculitis, and he had a palm uh, rash that uh, you thought that it was a writer's uh, uh, blinorajica. We thought, you know, it has a balm and soul rash uh, and keratotic. So it's very typical of reactive arthritis, writer's disease. So, uh, and I think he, his test was, Anka test was positive. So, yes. it's a little bit weird rash. So I sent him to a skin doctor with take a biopsy, but it comes, you know, as like in planus. Because this patient had a vasculitis, so it's not, it's not uh, fitting with uh, with writers, so right. this but actually the, uh, the ratio is a little bit weird for you know what's lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead with the next slide, and um, this patient uh, is a known basic patient. We had the whole features of, of basic with the orogenital ulcers and um, no, no eye features actually, but he did present with a severe headache and loss of vision in one eye and uh, he had a uh, lumbar puncture for uh, for manometry and and, uh, and cytology and it, it, the pressure was very high you did them um, you when i send him to to you i i give this uh, history and i told you that i'm suspecting uh, a venous sinus thrombosis so what next did you do i think you you requested an mrv yes uh, and I think I requested the MRV and it, it, it came both. It came, it came, uh, there is a uh, no filling on the right side. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was uh, sinus thrombosis. Uh, sinus uh, non filling. So mm -hmm. you decided to give him anticoagulants as well as uh, Remicade and steroids. Yeah, um, yes. Uh, I think what, we have to discuss it. Point? Yeah. Um, this this patient actually did very well uh, after uh, after he did that um, the the papilledema disappeared you decided to give him uh, to put him on remicade uh, as i remember and steroids as well as um, you also gave him uh, uh, anticoagulants so what what's your protocol of anticoagulants in patients with venous sinus thrombosis in basic patients Actually, you know, uh, thrombosis, you know, in basic patients, 
there is no consensus up till now, uh, you know, uh, about the treatment, whether to, to give immunosuppressive alone or to add uh, anticoagulation. Because, you know, in basic disease, the pathology here, there is inflammation of the blood vessels. So if you treat by immunosuppressive and take a steroid, uh, some of the clinicians consider that's enough. But as you say, you know, there is a, in addition to inflammation, there is hypercoagulable state. That's why they add, uh, they do anticoagulation. And there is, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of reports on stopping the anticoagulation. And some of the patients died from pulmonary embolism, got another thrombosis. So my, 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 my protocol here is, you know, is to give immunosuppressive, you know, when we got this uh, patient with cavernous sinus thrombosis, we have to do induction therapies, you know, high dose destroyed methylprednisolone, and to give bolus dose, and we give him uh, infliximab. So, and he did well. And we give him uh, anticoagulation as well. Uh, you know, the, uh, many years, you know, for many years we give warfarin, uh, but, you know, warfarin here, we have to follow, the, the patient has to follow in hematology clinic to, you know, to, uh, to adjust the INR. And, the, a lot, you know, a lot of interaction between warfarin and other drugs and even with foods. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a new emerging drugs, uh, anti-factor 10 drugs, like uh, rivaroxaban, Verento. Uh, I can, you know, I I can use it now. Uh, we start by, you know, 15 milligram twice a day for two weeks, and then continue for for 20 milligram. This drug, the advantage. What's the commercial one? Sorry. Zarelto. Zarelto. Uh, the uh, advantage of this drug, you don't have to monitor the blood. You don't do the INR or all these tests. You just go up with, you go on with the treatment. And uh, with, so uh, my policy here is to give induction therapies immunosuppressive, either, you know, uh, steroid and uh, infliximab with anti-factor 10. So it's much safer uh, with the, this anti-factor 10 uh, over short, short acting as well. So you, once you've stopped it, you can regain in the, the normal coagulability of the patient. There is no interactions, you know, with other drug and food like in, with warfarin, and you don't have to monitor the INR or any other test. Uh, is it, you know, uh, you will continue on the drug or stop it? You know, the, uh, I'm talking about the secondary prevention. Uh, I think we have to continue on the drug, even even if the if the pain has been minimized. You know, there is no consensus that the, right, you know, right, just, yeah. it's right. just, you know, my protocol. Right, right. So once uh, uh, your own protocol, once once the uh, venous sinus thrombosis has been resolved and the um, vascularization came back to normal, you would continue uh, with, with yes, anticoagulants. You know, just to you know, this okay. As you know, uh, Dr. Muhammad, it is very difficult to continue on infliximab here and the high dose destroyed. So once you control the condition, you uh, prevent the, you maintain the remission maybe by emuran and low dose destroyed. And I think we continue on this anticoagulation. Right, right. So uh, yeah. we'll we go um, to the next slide. And uh, this is the most often presentation of patients with Behzit uh, from the uh, ophthalmological point of view. It's um, almost 70% uh, of patients that have a, a, some sort of vasculitis, retinal vasculitis, uh, often with um, macular edema, macular ischemia, uh, and um, a pale disc. Um, these, uh, these patients, what I would like to ask you, what is the criteria for diagnosing a patient with basic? You know, there's uh, many diagnostic criteria. But you know, I follow the what I'm going to tell you now. Uh, the scoring scoring system for uh, oral ulcers, genital ulcers, and for oral oral ulcers, we give two. 
But it has, you know, it is recurrent ulcer more than three times per year. Maybe aphthous ulcers or serpaginous ulcers. Genital ulcers, we give it two as well. Uh, ocular lesion, give it two. Neurological lesion, ne neurological lesion, give it one. And uh, every skin lesion, give, give one. Uh, Bathergy test is optional, and you can give it one. So if a patient score four, we consider it basic. So if the patient has just oral genital ulcers, this one, this is basic. Even if the, he doesn't have any ocular manifestations. Yes. Okay. okay. So um, in a patient with presumed basic, uh, which means that he only has uveitis that is so typical of basic, and um, a male patient from our region, and we are quite sure that it's basic, except that he's not giving any history of mouth ulcers or genital ulcers. Um, you would consider that basic, go ahead and treat. Uh, my, my question is whether it's a basic or presumed basic. Uh, what is so different about basic than any other uveitis that with, with management? Do you go with, the, um, um, uh, you know, 10 milligrams of steroid and imuran, or you, you go for more aggressive treatment with these uh, patients? You know, if we are, if it is a presumed basset, and you, you know from the intraocular findings, you are telling that the most likely to be basset, your vitis. I think, you know, uh, first we have to exclude, you know, uh, non-infectious causes. Because, you know, if it is non-infectious uveitis, I can, you know, easily start with uh, steroid and azacyobrine. If, because, you know, I think azacyobrine is a mandatory drug uh, in treating basic disease because it prevents, you know, the progression of the disease, whether it is uveitis or any other extraocular manifestation. So every basic disease, I put, it, uh, I put him on azacyobrine. Uh, about uh, 100 milligram per day, and I am trying to, if I start by a big dose, according to the condition of the eye, after talking with you, if the, if you think the device is, is severe, we can start by uh, intermediate dose or high dose, and then taper it down to the uh, low dose destroyed, 7.5 milligram or 10 milligram. And I always left basic patient on other cell brain and low dose destroyed. I you know I'm not uh, brave enough to stop the drug in basic disease because I know it will flare up at any time. With you know with the extraocular manifestation. Okay, my my question is um, actually when when I see a basic patient, depends on how severe is his condition. Sometimes the basic patient doesn't have a very severe uh, eye, eye inflammation, but others would come with a very very severe inflammation that is very difficult. To, to manage. So I would go straight away and ask you for cyclosporin rather than azathioprine because azathioprine is, is pretty weak. Um, it, it would not control the, you would need a very high dose of steroid as well in, in, in addition to the azathioprine to be able to control the condition. Um, in, in other cases, I would ask you for a triple therapy with steroid, cyclosporin, and azathioprine. Um, I, I have a plenty of respect for Bessit. Because as you said, it can flare up at any time, even if it looks very quiet at the moment. Uh, it's an explosive uh, kind of inflammation. Um, so what I said, you know, what, what I said, you know, added to bring his, I consider it as a maintenance therapy. Maintenance therapy. Right. After induction therapy, we keep the patient, you know, added to bring as maintenance therapy to prevent relapse. But if he no, comes in, no. no but if he comes with severe vasculitis, we can start straight away uh, cyclosporin. Even sometimes, you know, many uh, you send a lot of, you know, many patients on Imuran and those are destroyed, and he comes in a flare. So we can add cyclosporin. We can add cyclosporin uh, in addition to Imuran. Well, of course, the, the other alternative that has been agreed upon is that uh, Remicade should be considered as a first-line uh, management? Yes. In, uh, if it, if in it is available, you know, it, now, nowadays, you know, the health insurance provide uh, anti-TNF. 
if if anyone has health insurance here in Egypt, he can uh, uh, we can give him anti TNF infliximab, and this is the, you know it is the first choice of course if it is available. So do you do you prefer uh, infliximab to uh, adalimumab, uh, Humira, in uh, in in, in Behzid, or do you think they are uh, equally effective? Uh, what, you know, we have to consider many factors when deciding to treat with infliximab or uh, adalimumab. You know, as you know, infliximab is a chimeric drug. It's made of uh, human source and marine source. That, that's make him a strong drug, but he has a uh, high autogenicity. Uh, so, uh, this high autogenicity make uh, you know, a lot of antibodies forms against the drug, and uh, after some time, tolerance develops. It becomes ineffective. So you have to increase the dose or shorten the frequency of administration. Uh, on the other hand, adrenomab is a fully human drug. It, uh, you know, it hasn't such autogenicity of infliximab. So you can get, you can go on with adrenomab for a long time. And I think for me, from my experience now, I think uh, adilumumab is better uh, than infliximab on long-term treatment with biologic. But, you know, sometimes I use the infliximab, you know, as a, a bolus therapy, like methylprednisolone. Uh, when, you know, I got a flare, I can give him a bolus dose of infliximab and that's it. And this for many factors, you know, because, you know, uh, most of patients, as you know, are not, they cannot afford the drug. So if we, we, can, we can give him a bolus dose to control, uh, one bolus or two bolus dose to control the drug and to continue with other immune suppressive, that's okay for me. Right. So what I understood from what you said, that uh, infliximab tends to be stronger because it's a chimeric. Um, and then, then Humira, except that it's ha it has the problems that it can develop antibodies against uh, infliximab, making it less effective with time, making you ha having to uh, shorten the interval between the injections if, if you're on, on infliximab. However, what I understood from you as well, that we often add methotrexate to, to decrease this uh, liability of autoantibody production. Um, can we substitute uh, methotrexate with as a thyprin, I mean, uh, um, give infliximab plus as a thyprin plus steroids, and this would decrease the the. the uh, you know, as you know, the other issue is infliximab. It is, it is given by intravenous infusion, yeah. and uh, you know it has you know more side effect than uh, than here adilimumab, uh, especially you know allergy. Uh, and you know, most of this biologic drug, you have to test uh, for TB before giving the drug. In infliximab, you know, anti TNF is general rule, but especially in infliximab, it can uh, break up the granuloma. If you have a latent TB, it can break the granuloma and activate the mycobacterium. So it's a stronger drug, but it's a, it's a more serious drug. To decrease, to decrease its autogenicity, that's why we give him, we give him by uh, IV infusion as a bolus. When he gives a drug by bolus injection, uh, you decrease the autogenicity because you know they give shock to the body, to the immune system, and in that way, you know, can dec decrease the autogenicity and the formation of antibodies. If you give, you know, it's a chimeric drug and you give it subcutaneous uh, every now and then, you will develop a severe autogenicity. To decrease the autogenicity as well, you can give a immunosuppressive, immunosuppress, as you said. The most common one is mistrexate. But you can give another immunosuppressive like Imuran. It's not like mistrexate, but you can give it and it will decrease the autogenicity as well. Right. Um, so we'll we'll move on to the to the next slide. Um, this is a granulomatous uh, bilateral granulomatous uveitis, uh, mainly anterior, and um, she was a middle-aged uh, lady 
uh, which is um, the first the first thing to suspect in uh, especially in women in middle ages uh, uh, 30 to 40 with granulomatous uveitis and sarcoidosis. So um, I did a systemic inquiry, ask her whether she has any chest uh, trouble, and she said she has a wheezy chest, but she didn't think anything about it. Uh, she she uh, she did not relate that to her eye condition. And when I sent her to you, you did some investigations. Can you can you please share with us um, what what kind of uh, examination and investigation do you carry on for this patient? When uh, a patient comes with suspecting sarcoid, as we said before, we have, we have to go through a full history taking, a clinical examination and basic investigation. And we have to, you know, there is some criteria to diagnose uh, sarcoidosis as well, especially ocular sarcoidosis. So uh, to diagnose definite ocular sarcoidosis, if you have uh, intraocular signs, you send a patient with intraocular signs suspecting sarcoidosis, and we make a definite diagnosis by a biopsy from a lymph node or skin lesion. So this is a definite sarcoidosis, ocular sarcoidosis, but it can be presumed sarcoidosis. If you tell me this, you find two intraocular signs go with sarcoidosis, and we found in chest x-ray or CT scan bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy without biopsy. So we can consider it presumed sarcoidosis. The last thing, if we don't have uh, bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy in chest X-ray, but we have three intraocular signs, we have to get another three investigation to consider it probable sarcoidosis, like uh, negative tuberculin test or gold test, you have to exclude TB, elevated, angiotensin converting enzyme and it has to it have to be it has to be 50 percent above the normal level the level to consider it positive uh, lymphopenia uh, CT, CT scan or chest x-ray finding parenchymal finding that goes with sarcoidosis and there is another tests but we don't do it uh, more often like you know Bronchoalveolar lavage, we found the high ratio of CD4 to CD8. So if you find one or three of these tests and three intraocular signs, so this is a probable sarcoid. So we can depend on this and start the treatment. Right. Um, is, is there any, um, if you find any, um, for instance, uh, parenchymal lesion, uh, lung lesion, would that influence the treatment uh, in any way? I mean, I usually write these patients a uh, 10 milligrams of steroid and again, as a thyroprin, 50 milligrams twice per day. Would you do anything different for these patients? Or do you, do you consider that enough or depending on the severity of the condition? You know, most sarcoid patients, most of them, they can cure without treatment. But, you know, when you have ocular uveitis find it severe, you have to start, you know, as you said, steroid and uh, as a sarcoid. This is a usual treatment. But sometimes in severe cases, we can add some, uh, you know, biologic drug. We can use some biologic drug, that, like infliximab, and give it very good results. But of course, with sarcoidosis, you're, you're a bit worried that this is TB in, in disguise. So, As I said before, before starting any biology, you have to do the uh, to test for latent TB. Okay. If it comes positive, you, you have to give prophylactic treatment. We give remectizide, remectizide with the biologic, whether it, whether it is sarcoid or any other autoimmune disease. So, so, you, so you can give anti TB and biologics at the same time. This is not contraindicated. Prophylactic treatment. You can, you can use still Remica or uh, Humira, for instance, under cover of anti tuberculosis treatment. Yes. Okay. Right. So this is my first time to know this uh, this information. Uh, I, I often found that it's an absolute contraindication to use anti TNF in in the patient with latent TB. But you you said that. Uh, yes, we can give a prophylactic treatment. Right. Okay. 
So let's move for the next uh, slide. This is the uh, CT scan uh, showing, uh, I think, higher lymph lymphadenopathy or uh, increased uh, bronchial bronchiovascular markings, parenchyma yes. lesions. Parenchyma lesions. Parenchyma lesions. So this is a TV. Uh, we, we will move on uh, to the next uh, slide. This is um, a female patient who presented with a hypopian that does not shift on head position. Um, she's uh, about uh, late, uh, late 20s, early 30s, and she complained of back pain, um, neck pain, basically. Um, I, I, I referred her to you, and you found out that this is uh, actually an ankylosing spondylitis. And you decided that ankylosing spondylitis can occur in females, although less common, and it tend to be less severe than males, and it can affect the neck only, and that um, you don't really need to give her any treatment. You remember this uh, patient? You don't remember? No, I can, um, can't remember it now. I, can, I can't remember her now, but you know. Uh, I convinced you to give her Humira uh, because um, she had a recurrent arthritis. Although her um, her vertebral problems or joint problems were, were not severe enough for for uh, for biologics or for any treatment, um, what I I will I'm showing this case because I want you to highlight the um, ankylosing spondylitis in general, how to manage or how to diagnose, and that in females it tends to be less uh, disabling and that is uh, less demanding for treatment. And that um, biologics is uh, is uh, your first line rather than systemic steroids. Is that true? No. Uh, and closing spondylitis, to diagnose it, there is, there is a criteria as well. You know, there is many criteria, but let us go with the uh, European Spondylar Strobacy Society criteria. If you have uh, uh, inflammatory spine, Inflammatory spinal pain or synovitis with one of the you know, intermittent buttock pains or sacroiliitis or uh, emphysitis or uh, inflammatory bowel disease or both the family history of spondyloarthropathy, you can go with, uh, you can diagnose and close it. So the criteria is, you know, a mix between the clinical finding and radiologic. So as you said, the, uh, it is more common in males, and there is many variants. You know, the usual uh, the, you have an axial type and a peripheral type. Axial type is axial uh, spondyloarthropathy involving the spine and the hips, and the peripheral takes the peripheral joint. So the management depends which type. But as general rule, you know. Uh, we, we, we used to treat it with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug if it's axial type. But nowadays, we start by logic straight away, anti-DNF. If it is a peripheral type, we can give immunosuppressive drug like mesotrexate or uh, salazobirine. In females, if she has uh, enclosing spondylitis, of course, we have to treat her uh, if it is uh, with biologic as well. But, you know, it depends on the availability of the drug. If it is available for her, uh, she has, to, you know, to take the drug. But as I said, I said you know, it, has a, it carries a better prognosis than the male for most of the cases. Right. In this particular patient, um, um, it was very beneficial from my side that the patient would, be, would go on um, biologics and on anti-TNF. Your uh, opinion was that she didn't need from the uh, joint point of view. She wasn't severe enough. However, you said that when, when you tend to give anti TNF for ankylosing spondylitis, you tend to give Enapril or uh, Intercept, uh, which is uh, not useful at all for our, for our eye. And in this case, we had to change to Humera. We had to change our uh, decision to Humera to benefit the eye as well. Uh, yes. And this patient actually did very well. Her uh, recurrent attacks are now very seldom or even non-existent. And when in, when there is a mild attack, it, it tends to go with just topical steroids. 
So um, this is a successfully managed uh, patient. Uh, in this no. next case, oh. I think there is no place for steroid in the management like like losing. Exactly. You know? This is another point uh, I need you to highlight because this would. Uh, uh, you know, worsen, uh, cause osteoporosis and worsen her, uh, yes. her joint problem. Yes. Right. And uh, the other point that I wanted to, before we forget, that HLA B27 testing is not very beneficial, is it? No, it's not diagnostic. It's not. So uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next case. This uh, person came to me with an acute onset of uh, loss of vision and uh, metamorphopsia in the left eye. When I examined him, I found this patch of uh, neuroretinitis uh, or retinitis basically uh, almost uh, affecting the macula uh, with the, some overlying vitritis. And I suspected right away uh, toxoplasma. When I referred this patient to you for, uh, again, for evaluation, I, I could have done the toxoplasma serology myself, but I decided to engage with uh, you, ask for your help for, uh, for several reasons. Um, um, the, the fact that a uh, toxoplasma is endemic in Egypt and then, uh, anyone is being tested, almost 80% or more of the, of patients, uh, tested for toxoplasma will, will come back positive. And therefore I needed your help, uh, as regard the, the titter and whether uh, there is any other features in the, um, in this patient and for the management as well, the treatment as well, the treatment often causes uh, GIT problems and uh, affection of the, uh, the the side effects of the drugs. So, uh, you remember doing serology for this patient? You know, if you, a patient comes with a positive immunoglobulin G alone, this is mean it has a positive infection. Uh, maybe more than one year. Maybe the infection is there for more than one year. But if he comes with immunoglobulin G and M, the M positivity means either uh, the infection has been going on for about six months or it is a false positive uh, immunoglobulin M result. Sometimes it comes, you know, with a negative uh, immunoglobulin G and positive immunoglobulin M. So that means it is either a recent infection or a false positive. So you have to repeat the test. Because you know it differs from lab to lab in accuracy, and you know, I have to do it in a good lab. But I want to ask you about you know if you take a, a aqueous humor fluid from the eye from the aqueous humor, I think BCR is good to detect the uh, to diagnose the toxoplasma. Uh, as true. So now BCR from the uh, uh, testing of the aqueous uh, is being used now and to a limited extent here in Egypt because they often require a large sample which I cannot obtain from the locals. And um, here it's a, it's a definite diagnosis, whether it's a herpes simplex, herpes hoster, toxoplasma. The other thing that they can do is the aqueous sample, they can test for immunoglobulins and divide the, the, um, the amount uh, to the amount of, of the serum immunoglobulin. And this is called a golden ratio. And if it's, if it's more than one, this means there is a uh, local production of immunoglobulins. And this would confirm this is an ocular toxoplasmosis. Again, um, patient is very reluctant to have, uh, you know, an intervention uh, sample taking from the eye, especially that the diagnosis is, is, you know, mainly clinical. And the lab test is just to confirm um, my, my guess here. Yeah. Also, you can okay. do BCR from the blood. Sometimes it comes both in addition right. to serology. Right. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll move on. This is a, an OCT, I'm sorry, uh, showing a thickened, uh, opaque uh, retina indicating uh, neuroretinitis uh, with edema. Um, my, my next case is uh, I know this the, the, the big problem. You know this patient, I know. She's a very nice uh, kid. Yes. Um, she's very um, bright little girl who is very successful in school as well. Um, she has juvenile idiopathic arthritis and um, she actually lost one eye to, uh, to surgery from done before 
and her left eye, um, after doing uh, a successful surgery, uh, she stopped the treatment altogether and had a severe relapse. When we controlled the relapse again, she developed a hypotony, which uh, we cannot treat. And uh, well, the reason I'm showing this uh, patient is to discuss juvenile idiopathic arthritis from the screening point of view and from the um, showing how serious this disease is and uh, what are the common drugs that we use and what kind of management, what kind of uh, follow-up and maintenance uh, doses that that we do. So to start with, if I'm suspecting, if you if you diagnose a child with uh, juvenile uh, arthritis, do you send her to the, uh, to an ophthalmologist? Of course, I think there is a guideline for that. As you know, there is about seven types of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, the systemic onset type, the oligoarticular, polyarticular with rheumatoid factor positive or negative, psoriatic, uh, emphysitis related, and the undifferentiated one. So they, they classified it if the uh, if a child with oligoarticular type or polyarticular type with rheumatoid factor negative or the psoriatic type or the undifferentiated comes to you and the uh, with ANA positivity or the diagnosis was done before the age of seven and the duration of the disease before the age of four, uh, duration of the disease is less than four years. So you have to uh, refer it for, uh, you know, follow up every six, every three months. But if the uh, other types, the body articular uh, rheumatoid factor positive, uh, the other types of uh, juvenile domestic arthritis, the follow-up for uh, their eyes every six to 12 months. This is, I think, this is the right line. And the uh, usual treatment few years before the era of biologics was mistrexate and steroid. And uh, as you know, Mr. Child, children, kids can tolerate mistrexate with high doses, uh, even better than adults. But the, uh, but you know, the usual dose we give here is between five milligram to ten milligram every week. Before and you continue, I'm sorry for the interruption. Um, for the screening, I I just wanted to sum this up for the audience. Is that ANA positivity, young age, and pussy articular, the, the, the fewer the number of, of joint affected, these are all indicators that this child is more, more uh, liable to develop uveitis and therefore should be screened more frequently and for yes. a longer period. Whereas yes. if the child is, is older, seven year or older, and the, he has more joints, polyarticular, more than four joints, and that the um, ANA is negative, this tends to be uh, a, a lower a lower risk. However, he needs screening as well with a less frequent screening and for a, a one year or so, and that's it. Um, I think the, I, I will summarize, I will summarize it again, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, the, the oligoarticular type and the polyarticular type with rheumatoid factor negative, the psoriatic type, and the undifferentiated. These subtypes are more likely are more likely to be NA positive. So, if a child of these types with NA positivity and and diagnosis below the age of seven years and the duration of the disease is less than four years, this is the most you know positive sign for you, right? So you have to follow up every three months. Okay. Okay. The next point that you mentioned is the treatment. Uh, you you tend the our our uh, standard is steroids and methotrexate until the the development of or the uh, introduction of uh, anti TNF mainly Humira. Uh, now it's a better uh, option. Um, you yes, uh, you always tend to reduce the steroids. Why why is that? The big problem with kids, you know, the standard growth here. You know, I have many patients in. You know, which, uh, you know, with the continuous use of destroy, they have a standard growth you know, the, uh, to destroy their lives. So with the era of biology, we can, you know, the, 
replaced, destroyed by uh, adilumumab. I think this adilumumab is the only FDA approved biologic antigen F for treat uvian, to treat uvian. And for children, we give uh, our protocol here uh, according to the body weight. Give it, give it, give it, give it. Which is about half, about half, half the syringe, isn't it, for yes, a child? The syringe is 40 milligrams. And we give the, the usual dose is 40 milligram every two weeks. But in the children, we can have the dose uh, sorry, every two weeks. Every two weeks. And, and then you, you tend to stop the steroids altogether? Yes, we, would, we gradually taper it and stop it and continue on mesotrexate and uh, adenoma. So you go, you go on mesotrexate and Humira? Yes, this is the usual regime. This is the usual regime for, for most of the patients. Yes. If, um, if, if the uh, ophthalmologist myself ask you for um, that the inflammation is still active despite the Humira and uh, mitotrexate and, and that we need steroids, um, what kind of dose do you think is, is, is safe uh, for, for these children? The problem here, you know, uh, when you calculate the dose of steroid, it is accumulated dose. You measure it, you know, by, by time. You give it in, in one month how many milligrams. So the lowest dose is the better. If you can keep it in five milligrams or even less, it's okay. Or 7.5 milligrams. If you, you know, go to intermediate dose or high dose, I think we have to think, you know, uh, other alternative other than in high dose or strong. Like, like what? We can increase the dose of mesotrexate. We can adjust the dose of adilimumab. You know, uh, you've had sometimes they increase the dose. But, you know, we have to uh, do a close monitoring, you know, because of the side effect of these drugs. Wh which drug? Side effects of which drug? Mesotrexate? And uh, adilimumab, both of them. Both of them have what side what? effects. What kind of side effects do you, do you expect with Humira? With Humira, you know, when you give Humira uh, or any other biologic, you have to do, and this is actually we do now, even, you know, this is a routine protocol in the health, health insurance system. We do, we do the routine uh, test, blood test, complete blood picture, liver function, kidney function, because you, sometimes you get bone marrow suppression, uh, liver toxicity, uh, but we do, yes, we, and we do, this is not usual, but sometimes you get, and we do a tuber clean test every six, tuber clean test every six months, and we do hepatitis B serology and C serology every six months, because biologic can re reactivate the virus. It activates B virus and C virus, especially B virus. B virus can be found and uh, can do pharma hepatic failure. So you have to keep an eye on the serology of the virus and the TB. So when when you um, follow up these uh, children, do you do you use the ESR or C-reactive protein as um, a guideline for yourself that the inflammation level is controlled, or you don't depend yes. on? Yeah, we, we do it routinely, you know, together with the, we do the blood picture and the liver kidney function and the ESR CRB every month or two months. But I depends on, you know, on the your parents. Sorry? Do you depend on ESR to, to determine whether no, I do, I do it every, yeah, I do every one month or two months, but I, I mainly depend on the uh, ophthalmological reports. You know, I mean, from I the am, joint point of view, from the uh, from the uh, arthritis point of view, you depend only on the symptoms of the of the parents. No, from the arthritis the, point of view, I depend on the clinical examination and there is a scoring system for arthritis. Okay, yeah. and this scoring system uh, taking account the uh, tender joints, uh, the swollen joints, and the CRB or the ASR. Okay. But from the eye point of view, I depend on your uh, report.
Um, the other point that I would like to uh, to uh, to say is that this is the only condition that we're allowed to give topical steroids as a long term, just to help with uh, rather than to give systemic steroids. Because very often juvenile chronic arthritis or idiopathic arthritis, um, the inflammation is is anterior and is not affecting the posterior segment. And the topical uh, steroids, despite the fact that we don't like this. But it's allowed in, uh, in children to give as low as, as every day or every other day. Um, this is acceptable. And, um, the other, the other point is that these children are, are very prone to cataract development and to uh, glaucoma, uh, rise in the pressure and uh, corneal uh, lesions. So they need very, very close, um, uh, monitoring. The other, the last point is that no, no level of inflammation is acceptable in these children. Even if it's a very mild inflammation, this is, this is considered activity. It's not, um, you should be intolerant to any kind of inflammation in these, in these eyes because they're very, very sensitive and they're very, very, uh, liable to develop complications, uh, especially in the juvenile idiopathic arthritis patients. Now we're, uh, we're going to move to the, to the next, uh, case. This is a, a patient with um, peripheral vasculitis. She reported some uh, skin uh, rash, which was uh, um, not specific. It was a um, migraine yeah, disappearing and appearing, and it's uh, it had a, a pale center, uh, a target-like appearance. And that um, first in the first instance, we thought of Borrelia, since the patient. Uh, uh, visited the U United States where, where, where uh, Borrelia is present. However, the serology came, came negative. And I kept following this patient for, uh, like 10 years. And she had some brain, um, lesions that was diagnosed, uh, by Dr. Sharif and by the neurologist we referred to as, as vasculitis rather than MS. Only, um, to develop later after 10 years or more, uh, features of MS. Um, this is, this is what I, I'm showing this case because the importance of keeping an open mind. We can change the diagnosis anytime. Um, once the signs have showed, uh, any evidence of, 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 of uh, something contradicting our diagnosis, we were very easy to, to change our diagnosis. In this patient, because we always suspected MS, our choice of drugs, uh, were a bit different. We, 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 uh, Refrain from give her, giving her um, uh, anti-TNF, for instance. You remember, oh, but you remember that we communicated about her that her mother had MS, and uh, yes, she's yes. a high suspect of MS. Oh, yeah, she's a high suspect of MS. Yeah. Um, so we decided to give her steroids and imuran, which is uh, again very safe, uh, even if she's she's MS. Remember that. Yes. And then, um, she was well controlled on this treatment and, um, her condition kept, kept almost steady for more than 10 years until she decided, um, she wanted to get pregnant. Um, and Dr. Sharif, uh, my, my impression was that Imuran has to be stopped, except that Dr. Sharif said that Imuran now you can, uh, you can go ahead and get pregnant easily without uh, risk of uh, teratogenicity uh, on in Iran. Can you can you talk about this a little bit, Patricia? Uh, when about MS or the Iran? In Iran, being safe with pregnancy. Yes, uh, adatiabrine is one of the drug. You know, uh, it has been used for a long time in autoimmune disease, uh, especially in lupus patient, lupus nephritis, and use it in, you know, in lupus nephritis when it is mandatory to give a drug during pregnancy, we can go on uh, with uh, corticosteroid and azacelbrine. No drug is safe, uh, but you know, we, use it, we use it a lot when it is necessary during pregnancy. And most of the patients involved, I, I didn't see a teratogenesis from it in all my patients. So in this patient, when we suspected MS, you you were brave enough to refer her to a neurologist. You said that this is not your area. 
However, you can you can communicate with the neurologist. This this has been a feature from, from my my side that you would take over the communicating uh, issue with the neurologist and discussing with the neurologist whether this is a an MS or not. Yes, when you are suspecting a patient to have MS, you know. Uh, because MS, you know, it's very difficult to diagnose. It has a lot of differential, especially, you know, with lupus, uh, some sort of jogrin, some sort of vasculitis, as a neurological disease. And as you know, there is types of MS. The it commit comes in one attack and missed, and it relapses after that with another attack. It can leave a neurological deficit, and it, uh, sometimes it cures completely. So. Diagnosis of MS, you know, now we need a referral to a specialized center, a specialized uh, you know, neurologist in MS. And diagnosis depends mainly on clinical examination, uh, history taking, clinical examination to find a neurological deficit. And uh, some investigation, briefly, the, you know, the, of course, the basic test and the uh, MRI for this gadolinium to show the demyelinating breaks in the brain and spinal cord. And we can do the lumbar puncture to exclude any infectious disease and to see you know, the serology and culture activity, and the oligoclonal band, the immunoglobulin, all of these. And uh, early, we can do the visual evoked potential. As you know, the eye is affected, uh, optic, there is optic neuritis, yeah, maybe early signs, and the visually evoked potential can give a clue about the diagnosis. So if we do all of that and don't reach to anything, I think we have to left this diagnosis for a specialist in MS. Nowadays in Egypt for, for a few years now, uh, there is um, three very prominent centers that I know of. Uh, one in uh, Cairo University Hospital, and one in Ain Shams uh, Hospital, and the other in Azhar Hospital. And uh, these are um, three large uh, MS specialized centers that provide the patients with the prophylactic uh, uh, treatment uh, to, to, to uh, decrease the uh, incidence of uh, relapses. Uh, these are very, very expensive drugs that can only be provided uh, by the government, by the um, by these centers. Um, no patient can afford it, uh, regardless of how, how rich the patient is, because it's a long-term therapy. Yes, they used to treat the, the MS here in Egypt by the interferon and by the uh, steroid, methylbrisolone and cortic steroid. Uh, and as a cerebrine, as well as the cyclophosphamide. So that this now of label drugs, they use it you know, as a force, third or fourth line treatment. Now I did they use another drugs for uh, prophylaxis, especially, you know, the best chance with the uh, relapsing remitting type of MS, and the, you know, the bad prognosis with the primary progressive or secondary progressive type. Uh, the using nowadays uh, some drugs uh, like uh, gladrimer acetate, metoxantron, and some monoclonal antibodies, biologic drugs like uh, natalizumab. These are some of the drugs. So, as you said, it's an expensive drug and needs health insurance to continue. Okay, we'll, we'll move on. to This is uh, an MRI showing uh, periventricular uh, uh, lesions. This is a, a, another patient who had a uh, retinal vasculitis and brain vasculitis on MRI. We, all, we also suspected the MS. However, she, uh, she um, continued not to have any features of MS. And the definite diagnosis was a systemic uh, vasculitis, idiopathic systemic vasculitis with retinal vasculitis and brain vasculitis. Uh, and in this patient, um, again, she wanted to stop all treatment, and we decided to put her on uh, Remicade, and it was still a new drug at that point. And then she developed a, uh, an atrogenic um, lupus-like condition from our... Uh, first of all, when a patient of vasculitis, when I send you a patient of vasculitis, 
What kind of investigation, additional to your baseline investigation, what kind of immunological investigations do you do? Um, when you send the suspected case of vasculitis, as we said before, history taking and the clinical examination is very important to collect data. Uh, because as you know, vasculitis is a multi-system disease. So you sometimes you have pulmonary renal syndrome, ocular renal syndrome, ocular pulmonary syndrome. So you have to collect data from the symptoms and the clinical signs of them. After that, you have to collect data from the basic investigation. Uh, if you bad picture, can you give a clue? The uh, kidney function, if there is impaired kidney function, uh, and the urine analysis as well, if you find uh, RBCs or RBCs cause granular cause, this means there is inflammation is going on the kidney, and you can get the diagnosis from the biopsy, from the uh, renal biopsy. And so uh, basic investigation is very important. Uh, when you do immunological investigation, uh, you can do the, you know, the ANCA vasculitis, the ANCA and ZC ANCA to subclassify the vasculitis. As you know, there is ANCA associated vasculitis. Uh, there is, uh, you can do, if you are, you can do imaging modalities like ultrasound, CT scan, if uh, on the nasal sinuses, as in case you're suspecting uh, granular, granulomatosis with polyangitis, the vaginal granulomatosis, CT scan chest, if there is a pulmonary disease, uh, abdomen, you can do uh, angiography if they are suspecting aneurysm anywhere or something like that. Uh, and after collecting the data, you can classify it as you know, in a type of vasculitis and you decide the treatment uh, depending on the type, severity of the disease and the organ involved, whether it's a major organ or not. So treatment usually uh, has two arms, the induction phase and consolidation phase. Induction, you, you mean by induction phase, you control the active disease now. And the drugs using induction phase is, you know, usually methylprednisolone, IV, bolus dose, and use with it uh, the usual immunosuppressive drug uh, like uh, mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide and uh, sometimes we use biologic drugs like rituximab or cetilizumab, like Temra. And after that, the consolidation phase, when you're controlling the drug, you taper out the stroid to the least possible dose and continue uh, on immunosuppressive, available immunosuppressive like Imuran, Mycophenolate, or any other immunosuppressive according to uh, the scenario uh, URA. Uh, that is the usual uh, scenario in the case of vasculitis. Right, okay. So uh, there are several questions here. Number one, uh, why, why is it so important to classify the vasculitis if it's ANCA positive or, or ANCA negative? How does this differ in the management? Number two, I would like to tell the audience mycophenolate is CELSEP, basically. Uh, they're not familiar with micro, the word microfinulate. And uh, um, um, number number three is that um, when you do a examination to the patient, you, you're you're keen in the patients of vasculitis to see if they have any rash. So you, can you can you clarify what kind of rash that you'd expect in case of vasculitis and how does different uh, form of rash uh, guide you to the to the to the diagnosis or to the the different pathogenesis you know, is anchor post this means there is auto antibodies and I think the pathogenesis is related to uh, B cells that's why we use uh, you know uh, here you know rituximab drug uh, as induction and maintenance it's a treatment of it is anchor associated vasculitis because rituximab, you know, uh, acting against uh, anti CD20. Uh, 
CD20, you know, this is a cluster of differentiation found on the cell surface of B cells that producing the autoantibody. So it is effective in this type of vasculitis. Uh, and it has, you know, a different prognosis. Actually, it is a granulometer's vasculitis. You know, this is all the name is Wegener and Cherg Strauss, but, you know, it gives uh, new names. So it has a different uh, clinical picture and different prognosis and uh, different treatments. Right. So, so what you're saying is that uh, it is uh, crucial to differentiate whether this is an ANCA positive or ANCA negative because of uh, different uh, prognosis and rather than the different management as well. You would go. Uh, yes. um, because of the pathology, it's a different pathology. So you would give, for instance, rituximab in ANCA positive rather than in ANCA negative, for instance, or cyclophosphamide yes. and so on. Yes. Okay, the other, the other question is um, the form of uh, rash in different vasculitis. Uh, uh, sometimes the rash is uh, erythema nodosum like uh, sometimes it's a small petechy, sometimes it's a um, target shape. What, what is the significance of each type of, of, of rash um, in the diagnosis of, uh, is, is it different names? Do you, do, you, uh, do you use this or does this help you to differentiate the type of vasculitis? You know, you can get this rash in most type of vasculitis, but, but you know, here we have the berberic rash, berbera, or levidoreticularis, you know, the, you know the levidoreticularis? Not really. It's common. And you have, uh, as you look, said... What does it look like, a reticular? Uh, it's a reticular, uh, but, uh, you, know, it, you know, it can occur uh, physiological with cold. You can see in cold, you know, with ischemia, a little bit, you know, uh, some normal person get level the reticularis pattern in uh, very cold weather due to, you know, a little bit of ischemia in the lower limb. It looks like, you know, like, like you know, uh, 